This is the Ask Foleschini podcast, where the modern economy is discussed from a skeptic's perspective. Mr. Foleschini helps you distinguish what is sustainable in our economy and what isn't. Not everything that glitters is gold, and not all mud is dirty. The podcaster Mr. Foleschini provides no-nonsense advice. He had it all, lost it all, went bankrupt multiple times, and is now attempting to come back from zero with sustainable growth. There are numerous coaches and preachers on the internet that preach about positive thinking and how life is all roses if you just care to see it that way. Well, Mr. Foleschini is definitely not one of them. We recommend you ask Foleschini to keep it real. He discusses the darker side of the current economic reality, the side that's more important for your personal and business finance. His first intention is to help you keep what you already have. Not to be a complete party pooper, Mr. Foleschini will also hint at the earning opportunities in the economy today. In order to please the almighty algorithm, please like, share, and subscribe. And now it's time to start taking notes. The mic goes to the podcaster, the one and only Mr. Foleschini. Welcome to the Ask Foleschini podcast with a guest. I'm proud to present Luke Andrews from Louisville, Kentucky. Luke is a real estate entrepreneur who has helped multiple agents earn more than 200,000 in gross commission in their first full year in the business. He currently leads a team of 20 agents. He's also a best-selling author who has written books in the categories of self-help and real estate. Luke, please tell us about yourself and how you start your business. What is your story? Sure. Well, first and foremost, thank you so much for having me on. I'm super excited to be here and, and talk to you and, and your audience. And I mean, from, from an entrepreneurial standpoint, my business is, is broken up into really three, three different silos. Um, so I am a real estate agent. I do help people buy and sell homes. Um, I am a real estate leader as well. So I have a team of over 20 agents, which you mentioned before. Um, so I'm guiding, leading, mentoring, recruiting, all of those things there. Um, and then I also, I also have an investment portion of my business, uh, that I started several years ago and joined a somewhat elite club of um, being able to purchase 40 investment properties before turning 40. Um, and so that was, you know, something I was, I was pretty excited about, but it, uh, like I said, I've, I've got those multiple silos. And as far as how I got started, I was actually in the, the corporate world for a long time. So in completely outside of sales, outside of real estate, I was in strategic marketing and data analytics and working for a very large insurance company here in Kentucky. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, so I was working for a, a very large insurance company and I realized that I just wasn't fulfilled with what I was doing. And my wife was in the real estate space. And so I got my license to be able to help her part time and fell in love instantly with real estate. And I knew I was passionate about the sales side. I knew I was passionate about the leadership side. I knew I was passionate about the investing side and a passion that I hadn't felt in a long time from the corporate world. And so we immediately sat down, my wife and I, and created a 24-month plan of how I could transition out of the corporate world with you know, my, my nice salary and benefits and bonuses and 401ks and all those things how we could transition out to a 100% commission, just a full entrepreneur uh, out building and running our own business. And so, so we went through and we did that. And, um, you know, that 24 month plan, we were actually able to execute in right at 10 months. Um, so sped up the sped up the process pretty significantly. And I figured if it was happening to me, if I were wanting to, you know, kind of quit that rat race that everybody talks about and go into business for myself um, and me being passionate about real estate, I decided that I would try to go out and write a couple of books that would help people, you know, kind of learn from my story and help them basically shorten and flatten their learning curve as, as much as possible. Mm -hmm. I, I, I had the option to read most of uh, your book. Uh, the 10 investment mistakes everyone makes buying their first investment property. Uh, is that your latest book or uh, 
It's been it is before. not my most recent book, no. Um, so that was my third of four that I've written. Um, I wrote one recently that was um, really geared towards real estate agents who were in their first two years in the business, uh, trying to help them get off the ground. That can be an uncertain time for a lot of agents. It can be a very risky time and a very uncomfortable time. And so, so what I've tried to book that basically established you as a someone that can help uh, new agents, because uh, as I mentioned in 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 announcement, you you help your agents get to two hundred thousand in commissions in the first year. Is that the book that helps them do that? It, it, it is. It, so what I did was I, I just kind of aggregated all of the lessons that these agents are learning and and what we're working on on a daily basis, and again trying to find their pitfalls areas where they've stumbled and trying to help someone learn from our mistakes. Um, you know, it seems like on Instagram and TikTok and everywhere now, everybody wants to tout their successes um, and they tend to leave out those mistakes that are out there. And it it can be disheartening if that's all that you're looking at and you're thinking, well, man, how is it so easy for these people, but so difficult for me? Um, I'm trying to normalize and get mistakes out on the forefront and let people know that we're all making them. Um, but here, let me throw some of my mistakes out there. Some of the stupid things that I've done um, that maybe you can avoid to make your journey just a little bit easier. Really good. Um, do you believe that mistakes are uh, more important for entrepreneurs, avoiding mistakes are more important for entrepreneurs, especially the ones that are starting with their real estate portfolio? then identifying the right opportunity. What is, according to you, more important, avoiding mistakes or identifying opportunities? Well, um, you know, I say avoiding mistakes. I mean, that, that's really where I am. But it's also, I'm where I am today because I've made mistakes. Um, and look, this book has 10 mistakes that are out there. There's there's 10 of them. There are a thousand different mistakes that you can make, and there's a thousand that I have made. Um, but because I've made those mistakes, I've learned quite a bit. Um, I, I think making the mistakes and subsequently avoiding the future mistakes helps you to identify better opportunities. So I think it's it's a little bit of both. Mm-hmm. And I think that that combination piece is critical to to success, but definitely having an eye on how to identify those opportunities on the front side. <laughs> Excuse me, because in real estate investing, you really you make your money when you buy, not when you sell. You know, you can always wait for the market to appreciate and you can always sell for a higher price, but you can never go back and buy for a lower price. The, per, the price you purchase is the price that you've got. Okay, that that is a very interesting concept. So that uh, you, you shouldn't make a mistake when buying, and you cannot mend this mistake in the future if you make a mistake buying for a higher uh, price than uh, suits your return on investment. I would also like to push a bit more about mistakes, uh, and especially people. Uh, the good people are really hard to get this uh, these times. I believe it's the same in your business. Uh, mm-hmm. Do you do you believe that it's more important to find the right people for your business? Uh, in your books, you you have a, a lot of partners that you need, from a good lawyer to a good construction company, um, everything, uh, management company, everything needs to be really good. Is it more important than you avoid the bad ones or it's more important, again, that you identify the right ones, which is the more important, uh, especially for the ones uh, that start. You know, I, I think it's super important to be to be able to identify the right partnerships, um, making sure that you have very similar goals, visions, and values. Um, and then I say, when when looking for a partner, I, I try to avoid looking for my twin. I'm actually trying to find my mirror. Um, so I need someone that, like I said, who who looks a lot like me from a goals, visions, and values perspective, but who has a different set of skills. I don't need someone that has the same set of skills that I have because I have those skills. Mm-hmm. So for instance, my um, my real estate investments, my business partner, you know, he is he is so good at seeing opportunities that I don't see. 
and, you know, kind of finding those diamonds in the rough that I would normally brush off. <clears throat> so I need him throughout that process. Um, and then I'm the one who is who is able to analyze the deals, analyze the numbers, which is a weakness of his. And so where I'm strong, he's weak and vice versa. So our strengths really complement each other. And I feel we can get twice as much done. I have a question. In your book, you're writing about your first property with uh, 14 doors, if I remember correctly. 13, that, yes. Yeah. Is that still the same partner that uh, you do business with? It is. Uh, so it's, it is a portion of of the partnership. Um, and so we we ended up taking on a secondary partner during that deal um, because just to, to go into just a, a very brief bit of that story, um, myself and this in this business partner, we knew we wanted to go into business together. We knew we had similar goals, visions, and values, and we wanted to to find a property together. And we were looking for something small a single property that we could pay cash for that needed some work that we could do the work ourselves selves put in that sweat equity um and eventually rent it out for cash flow and then just kind of use that to continuously um leverage and, and capitalize to build more and a package of 13 doors fell into our lap that we weren't anticipating mm -hmm. me being the one that can analyze the deals i saw that it was a great deal um but we just flat out couldn't afford it. And we didn't really know what we were doing. Um, so we sought out someone who had bought several properties in uh, in the past and said, hey, can we just, can we take you out to lunch and just try to figure out, you know, does, are we missing anything? You know, who can you introduce us to? How can we make this deal work? He saw the benefit in it and he said, well, hey, why don't you just let me be a 50-50 partner with you guys? Mm -hmm. And we said, that's, that's fantastic. Um, the problem was, is that because it was such a large investment, we still didn't have the capital to put down 50% of the down payment, you know, let alone hundred percent, we couldn't even cover 50% of the down payment. Um, and so just thinking outside the box, uh, you know, we knew we were going to have to have a property manager. So my partner and I, we decided, why don't we manage these properties for free? on a fee schedule where we're not actually getting paid, but it's actually going towards the equity that we're short at closing that's that's needed. Um, so this other partner came in, he put up the money that we couldn't, but left us as a 50-50 partner, knowing that we were going to work our way into it. Um, so that did a couple of things for us. One, it got us into the deal. It just got us on the field playing. And two, Managing 13 properties, we learned a ton, you know, more than we probably, more than we, more than we could have in years doing it the way that we were going to. Um, and so that, that really helped us a tremendous amount. And we were able to add some easy value to that property, turning over rents, doing a couple of small updates, which allowed us to build some equity, refinance, pull all of our existing cash out. And then just build our portfolio from there. Uh, we we touched on on the next subject. I wanna <laughs> I wanna discuss. Uh, you said that um, you make money when you purchase the property, and one of the mistakes that uh, you mentioned in in the book is uh, buying for appreciation. Um, is buying for appreciation is there any other reason than um, if you don't buy for cash flow reason? So that the, the property can finance it on its own. Um, the most of if, if you don't have other businesses, right now you're in position because you have three pillars to your uh, let's say business empire. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you wouldn't have other pillars, uh, then you would need to. Then it would be impossible to pr pr provide uh, liquidity if you would just purchase something for appreciation. Is that the case? Why you strongly uh, advise against uh, purchasing for appreciation? Well, and I say I I avoid I try to avoid purchasing for appreciation because I've seen many investors try this strategy. And and I say that because appreciation is the thing that you have the least amount of control over because the market is what causes the appreciation. Um, now, if you can see there's an opportunity to come in and add value, absolutely. But I look at that different than true appreciation. True, true appreciation 
to me is what the market is doing around us. Um, and so we know that over time, the real estate market is going to go up. The property is going to appreciate, um, but we don't know how long that's necessarily going to take. We can't always see the downturns in the market. And so if we're if the cash flow doesn't make sense and we're only banking on appreciation, if that takes longer than anticipated, we're going to go broke pretty quickly. Um, and so my thought is, is if the cash flow makes sense on the front side, the appreciation is just my icing on the cake. Um, and so that's what I tell people. I mean, yes, there's going to be some appreciation that's in there, um, but don't buy strictly for appreciation. Know that the cash flow still has to make sense and then just use that appreciation as a bonus down the road. Mm -hmm. So uh, being on the safe side, in in um, always on the safe side due to the cash flow that. Uh, well, yeah, and I mean, ca cash is cash is king in in most in most economies at this point, and so it's a matter of if that cash flow is coming in, the appreciation doesn't matter quite as much. It's kind of like paper gains or losses on a stock. It doesn't mean anything until you sell it, but the cash flow in the interim is what keeps you afloat and what keeps it coming back and what really adds the value. Mm -hmm. uh, in your book, you're writing about two types of properties. Uh, one are um, new ones that were just recently built and uh, ones are uh, in need of uh, refurbishment and renovation. Mm -hmm. um, do you work with off-plans properties? Or you just do someone that is already built and you can move in tenants immediately or that you know exactly how how, how long it will take to refurbish it? Yeah, so I have never worked on the new construction side from, from an investment perspective. Mm -hmm. um, it's it, The timeline is just too long for me and probably because of my AD, ADD that I have that, you know, I, I have a hard time seeing seeing that far out and waiting that long to be able to, to get in there. And in my market, there are enough opportunities that I can look for that I can put people in today that I don't necessarily need to look at new construction. And new construction, I mean, apples to apples on a property, new construction is always going to be more expensive than existing construction because you know the cost to swing a hammer is more today than it was yesterday. And the materials like the wood, the nails and everything else are more expensive today than they were yesterday. And so I'm generally looking for established properties, something that is already up. I'm, yes, I may need to do some rehab to it. But um, again, I've never been one that is that is built strictly for strictly for investment. So um, to, to, to uh, wrap it up a bit, uh, it's. For new investors, is sensible to avoid properties that are not cash flow positive in the time of the purchase. Is that correct? I, I, I it, it is not for me. I'm sure there is someone out there that that will dispute that. Um, but any way that I look at it, unless you just have very very deep pockets, um, you know the the negative cash flow just doesn't make. It just doesn't make sense to me because, again, I think you're banking on appreciation at that point, and then that is just something that is so far out of my control that it's out of my comfort zone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So happiness, basically, in your business, happiness is a positive cash flow. Happiness is positive cash flow all day, every day. <laughs> okay, okay, I got you. Um, another thing that I'm also interested in, what you recommend for first-time uh, investors is should they work with the uh, mainstream banks, local banks, or other type of uh, lenders and lending community? What 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 is what would be your suggestion for uh, first time investors? So a, a couple of things. One, I I never like to put take any option off the table. I think they should explore all of the options because it's based upon the property that they're looking at. You know, it could be a little bit different from bank to bank. Um, you know, two, I think it, it all has to do with, with their comfort level. But for my own personal opinion, and for investors that I work directly with helping them buy and sell, I am 99% of the time helping them to a smaller local institution. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if they go to one of the, the large national banks that we have, you know, you can look at it and say those there's a lot of red tape in those banks and it's usually everything is just, it has to fit into a nice little box. 
And if it fits in that box, that's great. And if it doesn't, it doesn't. And at the end of the day, they don't really need your money. They don't really need your loan. Um, you know, JP Morgan Chase isn't going out of business because you didn't spend, you didn't take out a $700,000 loan with them. Mm-hmm. Um, however, the small local banks um, have a lot more freedom and flexibility to underwrite on an individual deal and an individual borrower or an investor. Um, and so you've got some additional flexibility and creativity that goes along with that. And those banks are usually, like I said, there's usually less red tape. There's more flexibility within fitting inside or outside of a box. Um, and then, you know, your $700,000 deal is a bigger deal to them. And so they're more willing to look for ways to, to help you out through that process as long as the deal makes sense. Mm-hmm. Uh, how about the interest rate? Uh, would you go for... Um... A loan without the fixed interest rate these times? Um, I do, personally, for my own. Um, I don't recommend that for everybody. You have to have a bit of a stronger stomach for it. Um, you know, it's... I usually say if your portfolio is one, maybe two properties, or 10 plus, but kind of that three to nine properties, it can get a little bit dangerous and a little bit tricky. Um, so if your portfolio is small enough that you can carry an adjustment, or if your portfolio is large enough that it can offset those adjustments, I think that's okay. But it's that in-between stage that's a little challenging or tricky. Um, for me, I'm always looking at the option of you know, what gives me the most cash flow today. And that's generally one of the adjustable loans because they tend to be at a, at a lower rate as long as... I, I don't typically do the the one year adjustable. It's typically you know three, five, seven years. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Okay. Uh, and um, do you go for uh, bullet loans in in, in the projects or not? Or you, you you have a steady payment? What 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 was that question? I'm sorry. Uh, do you go for uh, bullet loans that, uh, or you just go for interest only loans? Uh, you know what I I don't love the interest only i've if i'm going to be if i'm going to be holding it very short term or if i am uh you know if it's if it's a rehab loan where i'm going through and i'm i'm using some of it for construction to fix it up mm-hmm. i'll use those portions as interest only but i do like paying down the principal on a on a monthly basis and i like even if it is going to be an interest only loan um i like knowing that I'll base my cash flow around a fully amortized payment um, that's taking out principal and interest um, and not basing everything simply on an interest only loan. Because to me, if I'm doing it on an interest only loan, I'm back to that buying for appreciation because I'm hoping that it continues to appreciate. Otherwise, you know, I'm I'm gonna be I'm gonna be stuck in a spot here before I know it. Okay. So basically, every first-time investor should just go with the repayment loan. Um, and- that it, it's the easiest and the simplest, and it's what they tend to know most from coming from their own, mm-hmm. um, you know, from their own personal homes. And so I say, I say, go with what you know while you're getting your feet wet, uh, just to make sure that they're not going too far too fast. And then because it's it's very very simple or very, very easy, I'm sorry, to uh, to lose track of, of what you're doing. And then, you know, you end up, you're looking at these balance sheets and thinking, oh man, everything's fantastic. I've got good cash flow. And then you forget that you've got an interest only loan or two. All of a sudden they'll adjust and your cash flow numbers just com- do a complete 180 and you don't even realize it. Now, all of a sudden you're, you're in a bad spot. Mm-hmm. Uh, and what what is your um, you, you said that you sold uh, so in the book you you uh, you wrote about your property in Colorado that you sold off uh, sold off uh, when mm-hmm. you moved. Um, so what is the perfect time to hold on the property um, as far as you're concerned? Well, it's it's different for every every investor and every investment and every situation. Um, you know, the, the one in Colorado, I, I probably would have held on to a lot longer because it was cash flowing very well. It was appreciating very well. 
everything was was great with it, but I was in a spot where I needed cash for another investment. Mm -hmm. And so I sold that because it was a quick and easy, and I, I wasn't necessarily in a spot to where I could do a, um, a, a cash out refinance on it. Uh, which I honestly, I wish that's what I would have done at the moment, but I was, it was early on. I didn't really understand exactly how all that worked. And so it, it just, it, it didn't play out and I, I lost that investment, but it, um, it, as long as it's cash flowing, I try to keep it any, as long as I can, you know, if it's cash flowing well, I'll keep it as long as I can and I'll use it for leverage for other properties. Uh, but as far as when to sell, I think it depends on it, how badly you need the money and, and what it's for. Well, what would you suggest? There are a lot of uh, popular investment opportunities in, in oh. some places like Florida and, um, you know, all these uh, places. Um, how would you go about it? Because for my experience is I, I, I had um, properties in different um, countries in, in Europe. And mm -hmm. the big problem is that you cannot control it. So right now I have properties just what are, it's about two to four hours drive from where I stay. Okay. Uh, what, what, what do you think about this? Do you think that it's, it's wise to have property or at least the first, you were talking about the first 10 properties before uh, when we were talking about the interest rates. Uh, what, what do you think about the first 10, let's say properties, uh, where where should they be located? Well, I mean, they, first and foremost, they need to be located where you're going to provide the the best cash flow and the best return. Um, you know, second, if you go through and, and you read my book, the the very first mistake that I talk about is the mistake of not building out your team on the front side. And I think as long as you build out a good solid team that you can trust that you know buying anywhere that there's cash flow i think is is okay um you know if you're brand brand new i like investing in your in your local market because it's something that you can you can physically go put your hands on it's something that you can physically drive by to see how it's doing um and i think that's that's key for a lot of these investors as they're as they're new because they're it's it's easy to feel overwhelmed. It's easy to feel scared and afraid. And if you can physically drive by and see, okay, it's still standing. It hasn't it hasn't burnt down. Or after a big storm comes through, that you can go by and see that the roof still looks okay, or a tree hasn't fallen. Um, I think that's nice. But if the property is seven, eight, ten hours away, or a flight away, um, it's not so simple to be able to go over and do that. So in the beginning, I I like having one that's close by. Um, but first and foremost, it, it just has to make sense from a, from a return perspective. Okay. You're talking about a uh, 15% return in your book. Is that something, a rule of thumb that, uh, most of the people uh, should use? I, I don't, I don't think so because it, uh, it's, it's very difficult to get that 15%. Mm -hmm. And I always estimated the 15%, uh, one, we were, at that point, we were our market. You could see some initial fifteen percent returns that were out there, um, and I always I planned on fifteen percent from the front side because I knew there were going to be expenses that would come up, some deferred maintenance that I wasn't quite aware of, um, that would take that fifteen percent down to nine, ten, eleven, somewhere in there. Um, and so I knew if I aimed for fifteen and I got it to nine, I would be okay. But if I aimed for nine and it went to four. I wouldn't, I wouldn't be very happy. Um, 15 is uber aggressive at this point because the market has just changed and shifted uh, since, since that was done several years ago. Um, but yes, I always look for just on the surface, a cash on cash return higher than what I actually anticipate. But right now, I mean, to, to answer your question more specifically, I'm looking for properties that are cash flowing in kind of the 8 to 11% range knowing that I can get somewhere between four and six at the end of the day. And I'm okay with that, um, with where our market is right now. Uh, do you invest solely in residential or are you also invest in commercial property? <clears throat> Excuse me. I am residential only for myself. Um, I'm not opposed to the commercial side of it. 
Um, it's just never been something that's interested me, and especially since the COVID pandemic. Um, knowing a lot of businesses closed up, uh, you know, physical space, uh, retail storefronts, and a lot of people working from home, that market seemed to be shrinking just a little bit. Um, you know, I'm still always, I have my eyes open for opportunities like medical, for instance, you know, medical facilities are almost always going to have to still have a physical presence and location. Mm -hmm. Um, but retail stores are going more and more online, you know, office space, things like that. They're all starting to shrink a little bit. I love the idea of storage units, um, and mobile home parks, but they are also, the word's gotten out on those and the prices have gone so far up that you can't buy them. Again, it goes back to the, you make your money when you buy, not when you sell. Mm -hmm. The prices have gone so far up um, on the front side that they don't make any sense to me. Um, I am looking at a few warehouses right now because I think that there's, uh, I think there's some good opportunities for that. Um, especially with the, you know, the growth of online, online shopping places. And that is all in, in the Louisville area. It is. It is. Yeah. So okay. we, we have a very, very large Amazon presence here uh, because we have the largest UPS air hub in the country is located here. And so there's a big Amazon presence that goes along with it. And then a lot of other um, online companies. And so warehouses are are very, very big right now. And that's something that I'm, I'm investigating. Mm -hmm. I have uh, another, uh, maybe more provocation than a question. Uh, is it possible to build a property portfolio with a bad credit? For example, like 400 credit score or something? Nothing is ever impossible. Um, you know, motivation will always trump qualification, um, but it will make it significantly more difficult. Um, you know, it's probably going to require bringing on more partners in the beginning. Um, but what I can tell you is if the deal makes sense, you can always find financial backing. Um, that's what I tell my agents who are looking to start working with investors. You know, they're like, well, hey, how do I find investor clients? And I said, stop looking for investor clients. Go look for investments. If you find the right investment, the investors are easy to find. Yeah, they will appear. It makes sense. Know. We'll find money. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's, I mean, someone with a very low credit score, I think they need to be resigned to taking a partner. Um knowing that it's going to be a little more challenging and three, just work really focusing on finding great deals um, because if they find great deals, they can still absolutely be a part of them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. That, that is a uh, really uh, good uh, uh So uh, I, I think this will be more and more um, paramount because uh, some people will end up in a bad credit situation because of um, the economy right now. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I want to keep them motivated that they can do it. And uh, you, you just explained it. It is possible. It's a bit more complex, but they should not give up on the um, on, on that dream, even if their credit uh, score has dropped significantly because they were laid off, they missed some payments or... Uh, that they had credit card debt or something like that. Uh, Absolutely. The, uh, what, what, what do you think about, this is again a provocation. Uh, what do you think about all these programs online that offer like start your business, getting credit card debt, you get three, four credit cards, you max them out and then you have down payment for for, for the property. That, that Does that make sense? Um, I, I'm sure that it does in rare situations. Mm -hmm. um, I. I, I don't I don't love that idea, um, you know, simply because you're you're looking at financing something with, you know, potentially a 20, 22, 24 percent interest rate mm -hmm. um, that is generally not going to be deductible in any way, shape or form. And then you're also digging yourself somewhat of a credit hole that is going to make it harder to be able to purchase more properties, to refinance out of them, to do to do all of that. Uh, again, there are probably certain situations where it works. You know, like I said, if you just find just this grand slam, can't miss deal and the only way to put it together is to do that. Uh, I would just, I would always recommend that that is an absolute last resort that you are out scouring for 
other options and alternatives. Okay. We, we, we discussed some of, let's say, hot topics right now. Let's discuss your program because you also have developed uh, really nice programs for investors so that they would not uh, ask all these, uh, uh, let's say, redundant questions I have asked you right now <laughs> uh, regarding uh, how, how they do it. You have a 30-day uh, real estate uh, MBA uh, that you are offering on, on your webpage. Can you tell us more about uh, what what um, investors will get in, in, in this program? Well, and I'll tell you, the, the 30-day real estate MBA is really geared towards real estate agents. Mm -hmm. um, now, it's something that if if you were if you were an investor who was looking to source deals on your own, which I always recommend finding a trusted real estate professional out there as, as an investor. Um, and if you're searching for a real estate professional, I'd always look for agents who own rental properties themselves. Um, they're going to be much more knowledgeable about the process and they're going to be able to, to really guide you towards the best deals. Uh, but it, if it was somebody who's like looking to see, okay, well, how could I potentially do this on my own without an agent? And they're looking for a quick and easy way to kind of see how agents think, what they do, how they process, how they work. Um, the 30 day real estate MBA is a, is a great option for them. Um, to be honest, from a real estate investment perspective, um, just going and downloading the, the ebook, it is 100% for free. It's 10 investor mistakes.com and it's the number 10. So one zero investormistakes.com. They can download my book for free. Um, and it talks all about the investment mistakes that I've made and I've seen clients make throughout the years. Um, again, trying to shorten and flatten that learning curve for everybody. And you know, anybody that has specific questions, they're like, well, hey, what about this scenario? What do you think about this? What do you think about that? Shoot me an email. Um, my assistant doesn't handle my emails for me. I respond to all my own emails. It's luke at lukeandrews.us. Um, uh, we're going to include that in, in the description. Uh, perfect. Or DM me on Instagram if that's easier, Luke Andrews RE. Um, so it's uh, just reach out. I love talking real estate to all kinds of people. And so it's something where it's like, hey, you know, what do you think about this deal? Or what would you do in this particular situation? Or what advice would you have for this? Shoot me a message. I'm more than happy to to go through and, and talk to anybody about any of that stuff. So mm -hmm. Th thank you for that. Um, I'll share everything in the, in the description. Um, and uh, you're obviously extremely successful in, in what you're doing. And the question would be, uh, how do you uh, balance your work and your private life with with all the deals that you have on hands and all the constant searching for properties and you have to go on the spot and check it out and uh, do you have any time at home with your family uh, I, I do i do um it is it is not always easy but i make sure that i prioritize the family time first um so it, it starts with me uh, coaching my kids in multiple sports um, you know, that forces me to put some time aside on the calendar and some very dedicated time with them directly. Um, and then, you know, my, my wife and I, we, we try to go out, you know, at least once a month together just to make sure that we've got some time away from work, away from kids, away from the house and all the, the goings on there. But, um, it, it's, it's not an easy balance, but once you, you know, the old saying, if you love what you do, you'll never work a day in your life. Mm -hmm. um, I I genuinely love what I do. And so I don't necessarily see it as work. Are some days a grind? Yes. Are some days harder than others? Absolutely. Um, but you go through and you just sit down. And I think if, if you genuinely took an audit of your day, you'll realize that there's probably a whole lot of time that you're just burning and wasting and that you you say that you're very busy, but you're not actually productive. And if you can find ways to just kind of shorten some of those times up, you realize that there's more than enough time throughout the day and, you know, an eight or a nine hour stretch to be able to get a whole lot done. Um, and so that's what I've tried to do. I've tried to be a master of time management. And, you know, part of that has been really dialing in my communication mm -hmm. and how I communicate 
and the manner in which I communicate, which has helped me not only in my interpersonal relationships and my time management, but it's also helped me become a significantly better negotiator. Um, you know, that's the one thing on my website that would probably be very beneficial to your clients. It's the three P's of negotiation. Um, it is all about communication and negotiation and, you know, very quick, easy, actionable tips and things that people can do in every single situation. You know, they're not real estate specific, so to speak, and they're, it doesn't have to be situational. It is just, these are things that you can do in your everyday life to become more confident, to become a better communicator and ultimately a better negotiator, which is going to get you the better deals um, from a real estate investment perspective. And I'll tell you what, I will have my assistant go through. Um, you know what, let's just do, I am going to do, if they put in, if they go to lukeandrews.us, um, all of my courses are on there. Um, if they go to that three P's of negotiation and they use the code Peter, um, I'll give them 70% off. Well, thank so you. Gonna, that, that's great. That's great. I'm going to have, I'm going to have my assistant go through and pop that code in. Um, so it'll be ready here in about an hour or so, but, uh, if they go to the website, lukeandrews.us, they find that course and they use the, the coupon code in the, in the checkout of Peter, um, it'll do 70% off. Okay, that, that is great. Thank you. So thank you, Luke, for this uh, wonderful interview and for being my guest tonight. And uh, I hope that uh, we, we can talk in a year or so to see uh, if things have changed and if the economy goes in the downturn. Hey, I, I, I love it. And so, yeah, thank you. Thank you so much for having me. It's, it's been a ton of fun. I appreciate it. Thank you, Mr. Faleschini, for this outstanding podcast. And thank you for listening to the Ask Faleschini podcast until the end. Mr. Faleschini would love to hear your feedback in the comments. And don't forget, if you want to know, ask Faleschini or listen to the Ask Faleschini podcast. In order to please the almighty algorithm, please don't forget to like, share, and subscribe.